ओके सर थैंक यू सर वी आर लाइव नाउ सो थैंक यू सर फॉर जॉइनिंग इन एंड थैंक यू सो मच दैट यू एग्रीड टू बी ए पार्ट ऑफ दिस इंटरव्यू सो आई विल नॉट वेस्ट एनी टाइम इंट्रोड्यूसिंग यू बिकॉज ऑल ऑफ अस दैट वी आर हियर वी नो यू एंड दोज हु आर वर्किंग इन वाइल्ड लाइफ फॉर इंडिया देर इज नो नीड टू इंट्रोड्यूस बट आई विल डेफिनेटली स्पीक अबाउट माई ग्रेटिट्यूड for the work the things that you have done and which has established the modern day of uh, research uh, not only herpetology or as a research or in wildlife as a whole because <clears throat> some of your contribution uh, uh, these are the like uh, madras snake park madras crocodile uh, bank trust then andaman nicobar environment uh, trust these are the foundation of many of us of new upcoming those who are learning yet in the phase of learning of herpetology and uh, research as a whole also about this ogumbe <clears throat> uh, uh, this rainforest that station that all of us most of us have visited and all the king cobra stories that originate there and uh, sir it's just like uh, I, i i am not that uh, basic an interviewer but i will i will tell you that how much we feel like that has changed the way that we uh, i know that the way because we will start off with the discussion with how much hardship they did you because the herpetology at that point of time when you started in india was something not very popular not something like that so nowadays because of your foundation and people like you who founded the basis of herpetology the things have become much easier for us and we just have to follow that step so sir at the very beginning i will welcome you and also want to know that at the very beginning when you started uh, the whole thing what was the scenario in india well yeah that's a very good point um when i came back from the united states after an aborted attempt at college i uh, this was in 1967 i came with the uh, with, with a very specific objective to set up a snake park because i had worked in the united states at bill hus miami serpentarium and i saw wow thousands of people coming in enjoying looking at snakes learning about snakes and would appreciate them uh I, as a small kid i was a pretty obnoxious kid probably because i was the champion of snakes even when i was about 5 or 6 years old and i'd say see how nice they are see how beautiful they are and people say oh, ugly things they bite you they kill you uh, so i yeah but i persisted i came back to india i mean i had grown up here since i was 7 years old so uh, it was my home and it is and it was called or at least referred to as the land of snakes snake charmers cobras everything uh, in religion uh, snakes uh, causing a lot of snake bite deaths uh, well i mean this was the center for snake activity so i was in the right place at the right time and come back yes you're right there was a rather negative sort of attitude to snakes at the beginning and from a lot of people so when i first set up the little madras snake park out in the outskirts of chennai people would come uh, very hesitantly come in and look over the side and look at the snakes but they started enjoying it and they started realizing that with our little talks about how good they were for the ecosystem how they eat rats how they actually help us and then certain paper like the indian newspaper put us on sort of their front page uh, on the sun, sun times and wow you know it got a lot of publicity state forest department then after the piece of land in uh, well actually I'm getting a little ahead of myself I should be doing this when I'm doing my powerpoint yeah. but they gave oh, yeah. us a piece of land right in the city and uh, that really up everybody's eyes because the first year we were there we got a million visitors in one year so, so uh, j- I'll just uh, interrupt you for a second I just wanted to tell you sir uh, your your network uh, that uh, that is little bit breaking down at times So I'm are you sure are you using are you using mobile uh, network sir uh, mobile phone or it's a broadband No it's a broadband wifi uh, link from the village it's a wire which is stretched over the tree uh, fiber optic we live in a small village so uh, it comes from about a kilometer away and if okay. the tree 
something with the bird lens on the cable, it might uh, break it up. Okay, so it's it's just uh, network is going and then it's slowly slowly establishing its uh, the buffering is going on. So yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, sir, can you uh, do one thing once? Just I'll try it once. Can you just log out and log in once more? M maybe we'll have a better network. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we had a little glitch in the network, I think. Uh, uh, he'll be back. I hope this time we'll have a better network. So uh, in this in meantime, I'll take the opportunity to tell you if you have questions, queries, or comments, please put them in a uh, single comment. Um, and we'll have this one hour program. So obviously, you can just put it in the single comment not more than one com comments and uh, i'll try to get some answer or response from him Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now it's better. Uh, uh, but then I cannot hear you, sir. Well, I'm speaking at a normal voice level, and everything else is working fine here. Okay, I'm now sure it's okay. Problem could be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's okay now. So, sir, I uh, as we are talking about the initial stage of uh, the whole uh, establishment, so. Uh, like when you i just wanted to know because nowadays we know of a mind frame before we go on to the presentation i wanted to know like now the mindset we know that you know that the mindset of general i'm not talking about the indian who are been like uh, who are associated with you or you have already uh, uh, gone through some uh, you know uh, capacity building or all but a general Indian, the mindset regarding snake nowadays, and when you uh, earlier at 1970s or like that, what difference do you perceive in the mindset at that point of time and now? Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me, sir? Hello. Thanks to uh, very clearly. You're not able to hear me, or? Uh, now I can hear you. I can hear you perfectly. Yeah. And now, now I can hear you, yes. sir. Everything is very clear to me. Okay. Very clear. So, so the, uh, my question was, uh, uh, yeah, please go. Uh, ahead. So, uh, so my question was, sir, in uh, the mindset of people in past in 1970s regarding snake, and in 2020, what difference do you feel in the, in the mindset? Well, I think people's awareness about snakes and their value in, in nature and so on has increased greatly, very largely through various television programs and partly, to, of course, through the work that we're doing. The millions of visitors that had come to the uh, Madras Snake Park and now to the Madras Crocodile Bank, for every bunch of people who come there, they're learning more and more about snakes. And uh, yeah, there's a much more positive attitude now. So, uh, so uh, like when you first started, because I'm uh, emphasizing into your earlier work, because these data are very important, because now the scenario I know we know, but uh, in early 1970s, I just wanted to get an idea when you started off with snake, what was the mind frame of India? Like they were killing snake rampantly or like they were associated with gods and such thing. What, what was the scenario, sir? Well, the interesting thing about India is this dichotomy. There are so, so many people worshipping snakes and so many people scared to death of snakes and they will kill them. And this has always been the same. But now in now, uh, on the more positive side, the people who used to kill snakes are now aware that they are actually very valuable parts of our ecosystem. 
So there's definitely a change in the mindset of those people as well. The people who always worship snakes will continue to worship snakes. And that's been a great help in conservation of snakes, right there, right at the beginning. So, sir, like uh, uh, when you when you first started off with uh, this, I'll, I am very interested to know a story about this. And I know that in the presentation you will have in details. But uh, what like uh, is such a majestic snake like King Cobra, like in Agumbe, what like uh, at what point of time that you realize that this snake is the one that you are going to work with for a long period of time? And why was that say, snake King Cobra so important to you? I don't think it's almost even necessary to explain because almost everybody who sees the King Cobra feels the same way, a, a sense of awe and uh, it's a very inspiring looking snake. It's the, what I would call the super snake and uh, it's just so magnificent. Uh, and as you get to know it, it's amazing that it's a very uh, innocent creature. It's, it's not a snake rampantly looking to people to bite and so on as people have probably proposed and shown in fantastic movies and stuff like that. It's actually a snake very frightened of human beings, very respectful of human beings, and just wants to stay away from us. But my real, uh, my first experience with the King Cobra was working in the Miami Serpentarium way back in the 1960s when I worked with the great Bill Haast. And uh, working with King Cobras there, I started to understand a little more about them. But it wasn't until I got to Agombe and saw them in the wild that I started really learning about them and being much more inspired and impressed by them. So, sir, uh, the, before uh, going on to the presentation, I also have a curiosity that uh, I see many, because you are a part of many documentary that uh, the, on King Cobra and many other species, and uh, because I'm a big fan and most of us are big fan of your documentary and your work, but on the hindsight, I, we have seen certain documentaries uh, dealing with king cobra where uh, the king cobra uh, the knowledge it's more about stunts and the knowledge that uh, shared by the documentary were very minimal but it the king cobra was portrayed as something like uh, larger than life it was okay but the information was not what we seek and it was uh, lots of hype regarding the whole documentary so since you have done documentary which uh, imparts knowledge so I just wanted to know about these trends of documentary where uh, it's more about uh, not not about knowledge, but about hype. Yeah, and hype, I mean, it's a very tempting thing for people who know a little bit about King Cobras to start handling them in a very dramatic way and to show how brave they are. Oh, oh my gosh, it's so dangerous. So uh, <laughs> I, and this is more to do with their own hype, the hype of themselves. And uh, yeah, I, I must admit that it's something which uh, young men, for example, in particular, are uh, subject to the desire to impress people and drive their motorcycle too fast or handle a dangerous animal or do something risky. So hmm. naturally, this does fit. And unfortunately, it, uh, the bad part about it is that it affects people's attitude toward a snake like the king cobra, who has nothing to do with any of this at all. And, and I and so, uh, like uh, most of in most of the like those who many people still in India, they will be idealizing someone uh, who is running around a snake, catching it and uh, from trees and jumping around in the water and do that, and then holding the snakes and uh, um, like uh, in a very uh, you know dangerous way to say, and uh, then there comes that scenario of snake bite. Some snake bite are uh, most of the snake bite are for occupational hazards that people are going. But there are some snake bite which are snake rescuers are sustaining some snake bite. Uh, Sometimes they are going to uh, co copy their idol and uh, unnecessarily handling that snake. So do, don't you think that this type of TV series need uh, when they are aired in uh, reputed uh, uh, TV mediums like channels like Discovery and Animal Planet, where there should be some uh, quality control or vigilance so that this type of stuff should be, you know, uh, censored or something like that? Yeah, most definitely. But the problem is it's not only, you know, the big channels, it's the YouTube channels that uh, people are just putting clips they got in the backyard or, you know, some snake rescuer wants to fool around. So uh, when you 
uh, if you communicate with us, if anybody out there communicates with us on the uh, website, that we, do it, we can provide, uh, for example, a video about the safe and sane and respectful rescue of snakes. Uh, our colleague Ajay Giri at the uh, Gombe Rainforest Research Station, you can look at his stuff online and you can see how calm and cool pictures are going from somebody's house to the back. Nobody likes it, of course, because it's not dramatic, you know, <laughs> you know screaming and yelling and jumping around. But it is the way a snake should be respected and handled. And there's not going to be any snake bites if someone is respectful and careful like that. So we have True, pointed sir. the way. True, sir. I have seen the documentary, uh, the video clip that uh, has been shown. And uh, uh, the way Ajay Giri was uh, dealing with the snake, it was really, uh, really amazing. Uh, so uh, in this point of time, we will just go to the presentation and uh, look into it because I went through the presentation yesterday and it was really interesting for me. So I'll try to share the slide. Okay. I'll just uh, refer to you next for the weekend. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, of course, sir. Of course, that would be all. Uh, can you see the slide, sir? I can. Yep. Okay. So I'll just uh, make it full screen. Yes, sir. Okay. We need to go to the first slide, which shows so, yeah. a yellow so, we... fellow with a snake in his hand. This is how it began yes, when I was here we about go. Uh, four years old, catching snakes in northern New York State. And I must say here, it's because I had a mother who was very different from most mothers. When I brought the snake home, she said, wow, how beautiful. Uh, <laughs> most mothers wouldn't say that. I'm afraid. True, we true. Same up. here. Okay. Next, please. So I just wanted to know before we go to the next slide, what snake was it? Well, it's called a milk snake, luckily a non-venomous snake. And luckily, my mother knew that there were no venomous snakes where we lived in northern New York State. So that's okay. pretty important. Okay, that's the important point. Yeah. So here we go. Okay, this is what I'm talking about. We can go past this. we we'll gradually get into all these uh, fields. Okay, the first snake park I mentioned was out in a village called Saleur outside of Chennai back in 1969. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it's just a small piece of land, and we got a grant from the World Wildlife Fund and set up a few enclosures for snakes. Yeah. <clears throat> Next. Then we moved to the Gaston Park, which the land of which was given to us by the uh, state for the Tamil Nadu State Forest Department, and this is right in the city in Gindi Deer Park, and this was amazing because we could see in the background literally thousands of people started coming there. Wow. <clears throat> okay, this is a hero shot, which we can go to. Uh, my first King Cobra was in Agumbe in 1971. So this is, sir, 1970. This is your first King Cobra in wild? Yeah, this is the first one that I saw in the wild, yeah. Okay. Yep. So this, this was a rescue, sir? It was, yes, just behind someone's house in Agumbe. And uh, yes. I don't think there were any snake rescuers in those days. <laughs> they were Snake killers. I think they were quite amazed that there was somebody actually catching the lot. Sir, uh, I'll just again interrupt you. Like uh, this is so such a brilliant talk that we are going through. But uh, this uh, the internet uh, is like uh, uh, your sound is getting robotic. Well, yeah, so, I, I'm sorry. I, I I didn't know what to do. So. Sir, tell me one thing. I can help you out. Do you have uh, mobile internet, sir? Uh, no, it's the signal from the phone is not as good as the signal from the cable. Okay, okay. Then, 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 then it's okay. Then it's okay, sir. Now it's a little better. Okay, sir. We can continue. Okay. Next. Okay. Please. Now it's better. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, up in uh, the coffee and tea states. Uh, this was in Manjole in. Uh, Tamil Nadu, they started calling me when they found out that I was catching king cobras because <laughs> they felt they were a threat in the tea estates. And they, sometimes the whole field would be closed down. They wouldn't do any work there because the king cobra had taken up residence. So I was getting called to quite so, a few. Sir, 
so sorry in 1972 the scenario like did, did you find that king cobra were often killed at that point of time most definitely yeah they would so, uh, in fact the reason in this particular estate there was an estate manager who actually liked snakes and although his uh, junior managers wanted to shoot it with their shotguns, they said, no, 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 I'll give a call to this guy. He'll come down by train. It might take two days. But uh, so they called me. Yeah. So you went uh, for, uh, travel for two days? Yeah, by train from Chennai down there. I mean, it was a day and a half, but uh, quite a long trip. Wonderful. Okay, then uh, something uh, happened which was very interesting, and that is that the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi visited the snake park, and you can imagine the publicity we got then. So if we had uh, already a million visitors a year, we got uh, a huge bunch after that. And Great. yeah, and the interesting thing was we got to interact with the Prime Minister of India, told her about the problems of environment, about the deer park, national park, and various suggestions were made, and she acted upon them. This was quite something. So what was the year at, uh, when she visited? Um, that was 19... <laughs> good question. I think it was 77. Okay, 1977, maybe around something like that. Yeah. And then after that, Rajiv and Sonia Gandhi came to the uh, Madras Snake Park. So we had quite high-profile visitors. <laughs> well, yeah, so the snake park was very successful. People were learning about snakes, but crocodiles were going extinct. That was when I was doing surveys around the country with help from the World Wildlife Fund. And uh, I started finding out that cro crocodiles were in very serious problems. Next. So the Midras Crocodile Bank was started in 1976 by Zai Whitaker and myself. And uh, we started breeding crocodiles in captivity. And this is how we were going to save them. So, sir, at, so, yeah. so, sir um, at the very uh, initial uh, period of Madras Crocodile Bank, so you were j dealing with muggers mainly? Yeah, we had 12 mugger crocodiles to start with. That's how we're and, 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 sir, when it went on to uh, shift to this ghadial thing? Yeah, that was a little bit later. We'll see that as we get on in the next okay. pictures. Okay. Yeah. So uh, then, actually, crocodiles do breed like rabbits. We didn't realize it. Starting with 12, we started to suddenly have, now we have over 2,000 at the croc bank, including this huge five-meter crocodile, Jaws, who unfortunately expired a couple of months ago. Oh. <clears throat> Next one. OK, as you mentioned, the gharial. This was very important because we found that the gharial was reaching near extinction. We could only count a, less than a couple hundred in the wild. So we started really uh, gharial in the croc. <clears throat> and it was very successful. These little fellows are only 15 inches long when they hatch, but they can grow to 15 feet long in 30 years. So we so, just and, have to look after them carefully. And I also love the one in one of your documentary when they hatch, they make a sound like That's the right. babies make. They, they these are really wonderful. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we started uh, breeding them in captivity and exhibiting them to the people. We made an underwater exhibit so that people can see fish, turtles, and the gharial underwater, which is a real eye opener. And children love it. They love this place. And then uh, we realized that if we're going to save the crocodile, we started working with a very famous uh, crocodile biologist by name Jeff Lang. And he started a radio telemetry project. You can see the radio on top of the gharial there. It's uh, actually a satellite transmitter, which uh, transmits a signal to a satellite and bounces back. Yes, that's the one. And uh, he's able to follow these gharial. Now he's got about 20 or 25 of them with radios on them traveling up and down the Chumbal River. We never realized it before, but some of them travel more than 100, 150 kilometers along the river. Wow. So it's so important to know this because we know that we have to protect huge river stretches without dams, without diversions, without river leaking and all these crazy things. I mean, I realize it's all to do with development, but we have to think of this as well. The 
protection of these species. So, sir, since you have uh, been engaged up close with Ghadiyal and Magar, and you are regularly feeding them and taking care of them, a general question for most of the audience that will come about: What is the because the Ghadiyal has a such a elongated snout? and yep. uh, in comparison to magar so how how what how does it uh, impact its biology and its food habits that's a good question because uh, the garia is very specifically a riverine species which eats fish hmm. so um, <clears throat> since its diet is not like a mugger who can eat just about anything from a frog an insect or even hmm. a deer or a buffalo a garia has to have a clean river so it can find and catch fish. And that's why it has this long, slender snout. So it's much easier to go from side to side and catch a fish underwater. It's very important. So, sir, Ghadiyal, basically, uh, they are eating fishes only. Apart from fishes, do they eat anything else? We have seen them eating uh, small crustaceans like the, uh, what's called, uh, uh, um, mole cricket, uh, excuse me, not... Uh, um, mole crabs and th things okay. like this, crayfish, okay. but primarily okay. fish. Fish, okay, sir. Yeah, so uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, we've been tracking Gurriel, uh, with uh, Jeff Lang is tracking Gurriel, and he has a team up on the Chumbal River. Team consists of the sons of fishermen who have been trained in doing this. So this is a wonderful thing. These are local people, People who haven't even gone to school, but now they are doing the radio tracking and making the data entries. It's all in Hindi, so Jeff has to get it all translated into English so he can make sense out of it, put in his scientific papers. But one of the amazing things we found out is that the adult male gharial, in this case a male, looks after the babies as good or even better than the mother. Gharial. So, so, so female, sir, female also have looks after gharial, a uh, babies. Yeah, the female does too, but uh, the babies seem to gravitate toward the male because he's the big protector. If a bird okay. of prey or if a heron or anybody, any creature comes and flies or crawls near where the babies are, the male hmm. gharial will come out and protect them, and they know that babies seem to know this. So, sir, uh, in uh, the small ghadiyals, the babies, in the, when they are growing up in the natural habitat, so uh, uh, what are the food sources they depend upon and what are the species they have to avoid, like they have been eaten by? Yeah, that's a very good question, too, because, uh, well, naturally they feed on fish. Even along the shore, there are a lot of tiny fish which they can feed on. But along the shore are many, many predators everything from jackals to hyenas to wildcats, even leopards, to uh, different birds of prey, eagles, kites, herons, uh, storks. There are so many. And of course, there are a lot of fish and even turtles, carnivorous turtles, which will attack and swallow baby gharial. So they have many, many enemies, and very few of them survive. So, sir, at one point of time, a gharial, uh, a gharial lays how many eggs, sir? A gharia will lay, uh, will start out laying about 20 eggs, and it might go up to as many as 60 or 70 eggs when she's older and larger. As she gets larger, she lays more and more. So the average is around 40 or 50 eggs in an average female so, crocodile nest, uh, gharial so, nest. So, sir, out of this, for example, if we take 40 eggs for an average, so out of that 40 uh, eggs, in an average, how many will hatch, sir? Most will hatch. And if given the right circumstances, and that, of course, depends on the depth that she's made the nest, the amount of sunlight, the amount of rain, the humidity, but most eggs do hatch. That's not the problem. The big problem okay. is when the babies come out, there's so many predators. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. I went to the Andaman Islands in 1976 for the first time and fell in love with it immediately. I mean, who couldn't? The, the, the rainforest, the coral reefs, it's an absolutely incredible place. So along with Zafar Fatiali and Zai Fatiali, we sent up, set up something called the Andaman Nicobar Environmental Trust in 1989. And see the next slide. And we set up a base on the tip of South Andaman. 
And this base we now call ANET, A-N-E-T, which is short hmm. for the Andaman and Nicobar Environmental Team, has been op operational since then. Uh, we set up uh, small, uh, I mean, huts for researchers to come and stay in. You know, just like we did in Nagumbe, it's very uh, tempting for researchers to come to a fostered area to do research, but it's pretty uncomfortable because usually they, if they're lucky, they might have a tent to live in. But mm -hmm. They can only last maybe a few days or a few weeks. But True. If you set up a comfortable research base, then they can spend months or even years there. True. That's, true, that's, true. That's why we did that. So we had dugout canoes, and we're still using dugout canoes for uh, to getting getting around and doing the surveys there. And here you can see there's a signboard put up by the forest department saying beware of crocodiles. So huh. there's no swimming in that area for very obvious reasons. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we were actually have been involved in many different kinds of conservation projects, both in the forest as well as in the coral So, sir, is it a limestone uh, crust habitat? Yes. In fact, this particular photograph was taken up in Baratong Island, which is about halfway up the Andamans, where there are some limestone caves, which are famous, became famous because they're in the... Uh, edible nest swiftlet. A small bird makes an edible nest there, which is extremely okay. valuable. It's bought in China to make different kinds of bird nest soup and so on. So uh, there's a project by the uh, uh, by SACON, uh, who, which has actually started out to uh, make a program so that these edible nests can be harvested on a sustained basis. One of the very few examples where the forest department is actually allowing the sustainable use of a wild product. But it is, it seems to be working and it seems that the poachers are being kept out now. Okay. Yeah, and as I mentioned, as far as underwater life goes there, it's incredible. There are still a small population of the very greatly critically endangered dugong still there, there are many sea turtles and an incredible uh, array of different fish species there. So. The researchers who come there get that opportunity. Let me mention, since we're just talking about the Andamans, that the whole Andaman uh, base has now been turned over to the Dachshund Foundation based in Bangalore. And their researchers, who are a lot of them doing marine work, are now carrying on the work that we started out there. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, mention both my sons, Nikhil, who is the curator at the Madras Crocodile Bank, and is, uh, as I say, up to the, his elbows because he has a thousand crocodiles of 16 different species to look after. The younger son on the right, uh, Samir, uh, works for uh, Flora and Fauna International in Cambridge in England and gets to travel around the world doing conservation work. So Great. Both, both of them, I didn't have to touch their arms at all. <laughs> Great. Okay. We're getting into a completely different thing now. I met the Irulas tribals uh, back in the uh, late 1960s when I moved to Chennai from Bombay. And that was a new period in my life too because I finally had a peer group of people who really knew about snakes. Okay, let's look. Uh, we set up the Irulas Snake Catchers Cooperative uh, in 1978 and we had various patrons, for example, I almost call them patron sits, for example, like Dr. Salim Ali, the bird man of India, and several other people of note, so that we could, you know, put a little pressure on government saying, here's something very, very valuable for the tribal people. So, sir, I, uh, I just want to know that uh, once you were here and you started knowing uh, Irula, so any of the very initial time, any of the incidents that uh, that took your attention towards the whole group, any activity, any snake catching that they did that you immediately uh, attracted your attention? Well, let's see the next slide and see if that answers the question. Well, uh, maybe not this. Uh, this just shows me with a whole bunch of the Irlis, but there is some very important reason why I started working with the Irlis, and that's because they were involved in the snake skin industry. And I think okay. there's a... 
a couple of slides, maybe the next one. Let's have a look. Yes. Yes. Okay. The Irlas were suppliers of millions of snakeskins. The ban came only in the mid 1970s. And prior to that, there was an estimated 10 million snakeskins being exported from India every year to the fashion industry, mostly in Europe and the United States, for making handbags, shoes, and so on. Uh, during this time, snakes like the python, when you see skins being held up mm. there, mm. were nearly going extinct locally in many parts of the country. And mm. uh, since the Irlas were the mainstay of this industry, it, obviously they had to stop. And mm -hmm. we were part of a very, a very vigorous program to stop the snake skin industry. But this meant great hardships for the Irlas. So we came up with an idea, the Irlas and I hatched an idea that they could start extracting venom from snakes, not killing them, but catching them as they always did in the traditional way. They are, I always say, the best snake catchers in the world because they know how to find them, extract the venom and sell it to the anti-venom producers and the research uh, laboratories so that the Irlas could make money, continue to make money on catching snakes but the snakes wouldn't be killed. So, sir, you just told that uh, the one thing that Irulas are the best because they know how to find snakes. So, exactly. can you just can you just elaborate on the point that what do you mean by finding snake? Like they can track the snake through their tracks, or they can uh, scent the snake, or whatever be it. Well, all that. Uh... In the old days, people say, no, the snake farmer goes out and plays his bean, his uh, <laughs> magic flute, and the snakes come out <laughs> magically. Fortunately, the truth is that snakes are deaf, and there's no way you can attack snakes by playing a bean. But the ears find snakes by looking at their tracks, finding a shedded skin, finding a snake's cat, and hmm. looking at rat holes to see if there's a track of a snake going in. And hmm. these are all... Uh, and, and listening to the calls of birds and squirrels, the alarm mm. calls, and following mm. up on that. So there's mm. many, many ways they have learned, over, over, from usually from their fathers and grandfathers, how to find snakes. Mm. That's mm. how they became such experts. And sir, uh, since they were, uh, they, you were talking about an era where antivenom was not that prevalent in the society, uh, so at that point of time when you first uh, made your contact with Irulas, did you hear stories about fatalities among the among the members of the society and how high was the prevalence of uh, death due to snake bite in their society? Well, luckily the snake, I mean, the Irulas are very careful in catching the snake, so there were a few bites, but several of them were bitten and there were deaths. And one of the reasons is that they have their own medicines which they used for snake bite. Now, I do not want to be derogatory about anything to do with herbal medicines, Ayurvedic medicines, and stuff like that. But let's be very clear, this is a really good lesson, that any, any remedy, so-called remedy other than antivan, is not going to be effective against um, sleep. There is only one remedy, and that is antivan. So uh, the traditional belief that the Irlas had in snake bites uh, remedies was, uh, well, it was a good, what they call a placebo, something okay. which made them feel a little better about uh, uh, having been bitten by a snake, perhaps on their way to the hospital, but it wasn't hmm. going to cure them if they had a fatal snake bite. This hmm. was a very hmm. important lesson. Okay, um, we can digress just a little bit because a couple of years ago we were invited to the United States and uh, we, uh, I had heard about this amazing problem in Florida where I had spent a couple of years hunting snakes in the Everglades and he heard about the fact that people had let go their baby, their pet pythons when they started out as babies and they grew into six, seven, eight, ten feet long monsters in the house and <laughs> the mothers and the fathers of the kids who had these pets said, get rid of this thing and they would <laughs> drop them out in the Everglades in this huge mm. swamp. Hmm. And they bred, and now there are tens of thousands of them. So let's just see a couple of the pictures of what we found. Well, a friend of mine caught, a, caught one Burmese python there that was over 18 feet long. Now, in India, we heard of pythons 14, 15, even 16 feet long. We hadn't heard of 18 footers. So I started joking, saying, yeah, it's the American food that makes them grow so big. But in a way, it may be true because they have plenty of food out there in the swamps plenty to eat, plenty of deer and rats. 
Okay, when we first went to the United States with Bodyville and Masi, they had to first learn about the local species of snakes. So they found a diamondback rattlesnake, and uh, we, they called it the uh, Mani Virian. They call uh, Mani is a bell, and Virian is their word for viper here. So okay. they call it the bell viper, which was a good way of them understanding that this is a snake very much like our Russell's viper, and they should be very careful of it. When they're jumping on a python, just be careful where they jump because there could be a rattlesnake nearby. That was always our worry, you know, a, a worry of ours. So we got them to understand and learn the local species. The Urlas taught several of the local snake hunters there that look, you have to look for shedded skins. And they, for example, they found this freshly shed skin of a python and put it immediately put up to his nose and said, it's fresh, snake is nearby. So we looked very, very carefully, and in not, not more than 10 or 15 minutes, found the snake right nearby. It was a really good lesson for the people who were with us, the local hunters. Next one. In fact, this is the snake. It was a 12-foot female Burmese python, and uh, you can see how happy they were. <laughs> and one of the Florida snake hunters was with us there. Here was another 10-footer that the three of us found while searching around the swamplands there. We ended up catching 33 pythons over the period of time we were there. And I think it was a little disappointing because a lot of the local snake hunters considered this competition to them. And I don't think okay. they really learned what we wanted to teach them. Okay, okay. That's, they take it in a negative way. That was a problem, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah amazingly enough, they caught eight pythons in one day. And I think at that time, this was a record. And just look at this amazing catch. Can you imagine how pleased they were? Because back home, catching a cobra or catching a Russell's viper in one day was great. But to catch eight big pythons, wow. Uh -huh. They were just running from amazing. Here to here. They were so happy. So, sir, uh, 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 um, generally, that the next question that comes to my mind that you, because you were in America, you caught uh, the pythons from Everglades. And then what did you do with it? Well, we had to turn them over to the state. You see, it is a government operation. We worked with the Florida uh -huh. Fish and Game Commission and okay. the University of Florida. And they take all the snakes and they humanely euthanize them. They kill them. And okay. whoever, uh, and they, I, I said, well, why not use the skins and meat? And I hear now that they are using the skins, but there is some reason that they're not using the meat. They say that it might have higher mercury levels because of the okay. mercury level in the Everglades. So I mean, if you have to control any, even an invasive species, it, it should be utilized in some way. So they are so, using the skins. So sir, the, again, another question comes to my mind. Like uh, in America, there are lots of zoos. So uh, uh, was there any plan that uh, these python can be for their lifetime as they live, they can be translocated in certain zoos for display? 10,000 of them? Oh, no, 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 that way. <laughs> Two or three, okay. yes. Yes. There are tens Ten. of thousands of them. There really are. They're now there. They, okay, anyway, we we did uh, some quite exciting things. We went to a Nike middle, missile base, one of the old missile bases during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, the Yurtlas went deep down into one of these bunkers down there and found this huge 16-foot female python down inside there. The interesting thing was that there were eight snake hunters who had been through there in the previous year and they had never seen a python there. So this to <laughs> me proved that the Yudlas had something to teach them. True, true. Okay, now we can jump into King Cobras, my favorite yes. snake. <laughs> Mine too. And, okay, good. Yeah, this is a beautiful picture taken by my wife, Janaki. It was a female King Cobra sitting in a tree in Agumbe. And yes. uh, the female king cobra is more delicate looking, as you can imagine, than the male. It has a thinner face. And usually from a distance even, we can tell whether it's a male or female. Next okay. one, please. Okay, looking at different king cobras and the different, uh, uh, the different patterns that they have and so on, and the way that they rear up, uh, everything that you see is a, 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 it's just a magnificent snake from any, any way you look at it. Next one. 
And uh, we thought at the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station, which was originally founded uh, on land, which um, actually my mother willed me the money to buy this land in the rainforest. And the Whitley Fund for Nature provided the funds for actually setting up the research station. I mean, the whole idea, of course, is that we study all the ecology of rainforests and do a lot of conservation education work there. But my personal obsession, of course, was to oh. I, I, I have to admit that. So we set up a base there and we set up a couple of cottages for people to stay in. I mentioned earlier, as we did in Anna, put up a comfortable place for people to come and stay so that they could do the protective research, whether it's fungus or frogs or leopards or elephants, they had a comfortable place to stay. And uh, yeah, uh, one year we did have 11 meters of rain in Agumbe, which rivals Chirapunji up in your <laughs> part of the world. And uh, yes, it is wet, very wet. And so humid too, I think. Very humid, for half of yeah. the year. And yes, there are a few leeches there, but um, leeches are leeches. Uh, they, they, they really hurt you except to take a little bit of blood. That's all they want. A small sample. <laughs> okay. And it's also home to a beautiful lizard. Again, another species, uh, uh, a kind of lizard which is found in the northeast of India. And that's the flying lizard or the flying dragon because its name is Draco, which is the original name for the, dra for the dragon. So, 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 which species are you getting in Agumbe? This Any is idea? called Ducenieri. It's a okay, different species than the one that you have yeah. there. It's a bit smaller than that one. But the idea of a flying reptile, okay. I mean, it goes back to the age of a something a prehistoric creature, which was, of course, a huge flying drag, a flying dinosaur. But uh, these are much <laughs> smaller, but very, very beautiful. Okay, now uh, to do the radio telemetry, which was precisely what we wanted to do to study the king cobras. I mean, when you catch a king cobra and release it, it's gone and we have no idea what it does. So we have to put a radio into it. But to do that, we have to catch one first, which is no problem because we're getting a call almost three or four times a week. As we said before, Ajay Giri gets calls all the time for mm. rescuing king cobras so, in people's so, houses. Yeah. So is this is this king cobra rescued from within a well? This was in a well, yes. Ah, and it was a difficult yeah. task taking it out too. So because yeah, I too. see this, I see this thing. Yeah. So okay, uh, next one. Okay, or on a roof, for example, uh, king cobra come to people's houses, usually searching for snakes. Rat snakes and cobras regularly come to people's houses searching for rats. And the king cobra, using his very good sense of smell, will follow that snake and catch it and eat it right in someone's house sometimes. So, sir, in between, I'll ask before I go to the next slide, uh, because you have reared king cobra and you know lots, and uh, uh, for even for some uh, rescue centers across Assam, I just wanted to know, like, uh, all the time, like, snakes are not available for, to feed them. So, like many a times, because do they obligatorily feed on snake, but or there is some alternative that we can provide? Well, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But the only thing that we know for sure they eat other than snakes is monitor lizards. Okay. So okay. only snakes. That's primarily snakes. Their their scientific name is Ophiophagus, yes. which yes. actually is translated to snake eater. So he is True. definitely concentrates on finding snakes. Yeah. Okay, uh, sometimes they end up in, uh, maybe he wanted a little bit of warmth, so he went into the hood of this little car, and uh, yeah, I'm actually a little bit frightened to uh, get in the car and drive away, so they call Ajay. Cool. Next one. Okay, Dr. Matt Good and Dr. Aniruddha Balsari uh, did the first implanting of radio at King Cobra back in 2008 when we started the telemetry program. Dr. Matt Good was from University of Arizona. Okay. And then we had to, of course, um, hire, uh, well, we didn't have to really hire them. We had a lot of volunteers, the young students who are actually holding the antenna. 
go along with uh, the local tracker who is seated behind. He's a guy who knows the forest area there. So this is a very really good team, which still, uh, we still have the same sort of teamwork of, of one local guy and very mm -hmm. often outside volunteers who come and follow the snakes. They have to follow the snakes up to 10 or 12 hours a day. We can't lose the snake because the radio has a range of a half kilometer. If the snake disappears, so it's a big problem, as you can imagine. We've lost it. Okay, um, one snake cobra, which we had actually, this was an experiment. We decided that we'd try to prove the fact that translocating a king cobra, catching it in one place and taking it far away and releasing another at another place is very bad for the snake. And we proved it. This snake traveled 100 kilometers in less than a year. Now, can you imagine a snake traveling 100 kilometers? It's, it's just, it, it's out of our concept that, that, that a right. snake can move so far. <clears throat> Go on. Next one. And it traveled across this entire landscape and you can see that it includes forest, it includes uh, uh, groves of coconut trees as well as patches of forest. So the snake had to put up with a lot of human activity as well. <clears throat> Next one. And including crossing roads, which is a very dangerous activity that comes speeding down the road. The nice thing is, <clears throat> when you're following one snake, you very often are led to another snake. So when we were following the first male king cobra, he would get it. And in the next season, he would, uh, if he found another male coming close to his territory, he would start doing male combat. And we think it's the winner, this combat, who gets to mate. When I say combat, this is a wrestling match. They don't bite each other. It's simply wrestling, trying to pin down the other one. Next. And the amazing thing about king cobras, of course, I mean, we have over 3,000 different species of snakes in the world, and yet only one species makes a nest, and that's the king cobra. That makes it, again, such a special snake. She might take two or three weeks to gather leaves together and make this big mound in order to make an incubation chamber for the 20 or 30 eggs that she'll lay inside and then lie on the nest to make sure no predators come. Next. The babies hatch anywhere from 70 to 100 days later, depending on temperature. And we've noticed, uh, we've collected many uh, nests because they were laid next to somebody's house. So we've had to take the eggs out just because to make the people feel okay with the fact and then let the babies go some ways away from the house. But invariably, most of the eggs do hatch. But again, I like with the gharial, most of the babies don't survive because there are so many predators, other snakes, birds of prey, mongooses, civet cats, wild boar, lots of monitor lizards, a lot of creatures eat the baby snakes. So sir, uh, how venomous are the babies when they are born? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question, which we don't really know the answer to because no one has done a study on baby king cobra venom, which should be done soon, we hope. But uh, we expect that it would be toxic because they have to catch and kill little snakes when they're babies. Right? So it's probably so, very toxic. It's just that the quantity will be very less. So, uh, so I just wanted to know, like, in the whole process, because... Uh, you have been dealing with so many babies and adult king cobra. If uh, somebody is bitten by a, uh, is there a, a case where a person was bitten by a baby uh, hatchling king cobra? No, I haven't heard of that. The only okay. uh, recent king cobra bites have been crazy rescuers who have done something either while they were drunk or while they were being stupid. And okay. they got bit. We know of three people in recent years who were catching king cobras and got bitten and killed. Okay. Here's a little baby who's just hat. We found out something very interesting. As soon as they hatch, they seem to head straight up. They go up into the bamboo or into the uh, trees nearby. And it makes a lot of sense because most of the predators are pretty down on the ground. So True. Uh, they're, they're much safer higher up. But they're very beautiful when they're small like this. Very True. Beautiful. And of course, they feed on larger snakes like this rat snake, and the rat snake tries to retaliate by biting back. 
but the Koga has his good hard skills and tough skills, I should say, so he's not really affected. We even saw a King Cobra being bitten right over the eye by a rat snake, and nothing happened to the King Cobra. So, the rat sir, snake might take 10 or 15 minutes to die, and then he gets swallowed. So, sir, I have also seen uh, King Cobra eating on uh, Cobra, Indian oh, yeah. Cobra. So uh, I see. I have seen that Indian cobra bit uh, king cobra, but are yeah. they are king cobra immune to the venom of other uh, cobra and cray? We'd really, yeah, we'd really love to know that. We think that it is because we have also seen king cobras being bitten both by cobras and pit vipers on quite a regular ah. basis, and ah. the king cobra doesn't seem to be affected at all. Okay. So okay. We, we, yeah, that's an interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah, and here's one, of course, at a cobra. If you've seen it yourself, it's quite an amazing thing. And the cobra seems to know immediately that he's in big trouble and, <laughs> and put on a show, but he's had it. Once the king cobra is after a snake, the snake has had it. Here's, in, here's a case of a pit viper biting uh, a king cobra as he gets bitten. This is a Malabar pit viper. And ah. again, the king cobra is totally unaffected. Okay, there are many other studies on uh, Western Ghats biodiversity at the uh, at Agumbe Rainforest Research Station. So let's just do a few pictures which show some of the creatures that are there. And these are just been going on. Well, and of course the lion-tailed macaque, one of the critically endangered species. There are numbers of these there. In fact, there are several leopards who use our base as a home range which is quite yeah. nice to see them on a regular basis. And a lot of new species, particularly frogs, new species of frogs are being discovered there. There's a, a shot of a coral snake swallowing a, a shield-tailed snake. Next one. And uh, we are actually uh, at a, a good place for people to come for meetings because, of course, they want to experience the rainforest themselves. And we've had quite a few groups, both from uh, mostly from within India, but from around the world as well, to uh, see our work there and to be involved in our work. Yep. And we have very much more local people. As the same thing uh, Jeff Fang has done with local fishermen's sons working there. This young lady is a zoologist student at a college nearby, and she was monitoring the temperature of the king cobra nest behind her. And it was not even 100 meters away from her house. Her father and I were a little bit nervous about it, but we promised to remove the baby once they hatched. And we did. OK, uh, it was, uh, you mentioned earlier that people uh, see a lot of the films that we made. And I, I, I'm very gratified that you know, all the Sneak Park and now, of course, the Crooked Bank uh, shows millions of people the things that we're doing and people learn from it. They bring their children and get hands-on experience. These films, uh, TV films, and I'll reach tens of millions of people, sometimes in one showing. And this cool. is really a fantastic educational tool. So we took full advantage of it. Next one. Yeah, some of the, well, when I say recent, they're not really that recent, but <laughs> there's one we made about Gariel called Crocodile Blues. One about uh, just dragons in general with the Komodo dragon picture there. One about snake bite, one million snake bites, which I encourage everyone to see because it says it has a, quite a few interesting lessons. And one very interesting diversion from my usual leopards, my usual reptiles, was this <laughs> film about leopards, which uh, was also very, very a big eye opener for me. Where, I, where we live right now, outside of our house, um, there's a forest not even 100 meters from here where leopards live. So we have to learn to live with them, and we certainly did. And education programs have been very, very successful. And you know, uh, when you earlier asked about the difference in attitudes to, uh, for the people towards snakes back in the 70s and now, you know, children have always been very fascinated by snakes. Their first reaction, because their parents have said, no, no, snake, oh, terrible, dangerous. That's their first reaction. But once they see how beautiful it is and they touch it and see, wow, it's smooth and clean and nice and wonderful, 
people, the children absolutely change their minds. And you actually have to be careful. Look, don't pick up the next snake you see. <laughs> ask, please ask us whether it's venomous or not. So true, we have to true. be a little careful with children. They get a little bit too enthusiastic. <laughs> and of course, turtles and tortoises are always a big a attraction and children love them. Yeah. And this is just another example. Cool, school kids just gathering around. As soon as you pull a snake out, everyone wants to touch it. Everyone wants to hold it. And I have to hold them back and say, look, take it easy. Don't, don't get the snake too nervous now. You might think you're nervous, but you imagine the snake, how nervous he is. So, but it's a wonderful learning opportunity for them. True. And workshops, of course, uh, at colleges and for forest department staff, in this case, a huge office uh, of forest department staff in uh, Shimoga district in Karnataka. And uh, we're producing posters for them that they can put up at their various stations, field stations and ranger stations, getting people to learn and understand the different species of snakes. It's kind of like bird watching. People, you know, are more are easy, more easily brought into the fold to watch birds. But for snake watching is a little more difficult. It takes a little more pushing, a little more education, and things like materials like posters and stuff like that, and lectures, of course. True. And in this in this case, it was the special task force for the uh, that that are based in Agumbe. And they said, they came to us with this request. They said, look, we come across King Cobras in the forest. And I don't know if you can see the AK-47. <laughs> I see. I see. On the ground there. We're, we're very worried that they're going to get too frightened and excited when they see this <laughs> King Cobra in the wild. They say, look, don't worry. The snake is not interested in you. He doesn't want to do anything but get away from you. So hmm. I think our education programs are very important and have done some very uh, good work in getting these people to be not frightened of snakes. They'll respect them, yes, but they don't have to be frightened of them. True. Yep, and uh, as I said earlier, it's just very easy and wonderful to get children on board. And of course, their teachers are the ones who have to be convinced that this is an, a, a wonderful opportunity for them. But once they get on board, they realize how exciting it is. And yeah, the local people, are, well, they might have freaked out about king cobras before. They never did usually king, kill king cobras in Agombe because they worship them there. But now they have a much better attitude. You can even see the grin on the lady's face <laughs> as she looks at this king cobra. It's right in front of her, but she's not worried. OK, let, um, since we were just talking about king cobras there, let me just mention one thing. We have a friend called Murti, who uh, has a Western Ghats uh, uh, Environment Wildlife Society over in, uh, in, uh, on the, in Eastern Ghats uh, Wildlife Society over in, uh, in Andhra Pradesh. And there they do king, kill king cobras. So we've recently made a fil uh, film with some, uh, some colleagues of ours made a film called Living with the King in which we interviewed a lot of the people like these ladies here in, a, in the Agumbe area to try to sensitize people in other parts of India. This film was then dubbed in Telugu and Murti is showing it over there in Andhra. And instead of killing king cobras, he's starting to get rescue calls. Yeah. People find a king cobra instead of killing it and us, instead of us seeing horrible pictures of mangled king cobras usually posted in newspapers or online, mm -hmm. We're seeing people actually rescuing king cobras and releasing them away from the house where they were found. So it, it really works to educate people about this wonderful snake. Yep. All right, getting into snake bite. Uh, this is kind of my current obsession. Uh, it's, it's a bit difficult from being at home, but this is a, a good start. Your opportunity for me to tell people about the whole snake bite thing. And I think this prevention is the best cure. You've heard this said in so many ways for so many different diseases and circumstances, but in snake bite, it really means something, prevention. Okay, let's look at a few. All right, the facts are that over 50,000 people die from snake bite each year in India. And we tell this to people abroad and it's kind of mind boggling. They don't realize that snake bite is such an important 
problem in India. And we have four species, which I'll just show you, which cause most of these snake bite deaths. The really important thing is that snake bite is preventable and treatable. And the fourth really important fact is that antivenom is the only, only cure. This is what I brought, brought up earlier in the talk. Next. Okay, Russell's viper is number one. You can hardly see him. He's in the foreground, and uh, it's partly hidden by our little logos there, our URLs. But the Russell's viper blends in beautifully to his background and is very often near agricultural fields, as are cobras. And why are they there? And it's because of the rodents. Rodents and amphibians live in rice fields and in other agricultural fields for obvious reasons. And this is why we have so many snakes in agricultural areas. Next. The crate is another snake which is found, uh, which feeds on rodents largely, and is also found near agricultural areas. It's a nocturnal snake. It's never seen active during the day, but it has the unfortunate uh, habit of coming into people's houses, huts at night, searching for rodents to begin with. And sometimes encountering a human sleeping on the floor or on the ground, and people get bitten at night. So, but there are remedies for this to prevent. The sawscale viper, uh, the photograph here shows it as a large snake, but actually it's a tiny snake. It's hardly 10 or 15 inches long. It's not found up in Northeast India, but it's found in the rest of the geographic zone, uh, area of India, mostly in dry areas, in open dry areas, in. Rajasthan, Gujarat, it's very common. Parts of Maharashtra along the coast, it's very common. And here in Tamil Nadu, it's also very common. It's called one of the big four, but it is the smallest of the big four. All right, when you're talking about preventable, uh, the prevention of snake bite, I think educating people is probably the main thing that we have to do. First of all, most snakes are harmless. They avoid humans. If you use a torch at night and you sleep using a mosquito net, you are probably going to probably solve 50% of the snake bite problems in India. Now, snakes eat rats, so keep rats away. Keep them away from your house. That means using rat traps, sealing up rat holes. Keep rats away, and you probably keep snakes away. And the main thing is, if someone is bitten, he, has to, he or she has to get to the hospital fast without wasting time on other remedies and other foolishness, just get to the only remedy, which is antivenom. Next one. So uh, before right. we go to the next slide, I, I have a question again. Uh, like uh, you you told that uh, the only remedy is antivenom, but uh, uh, because you have uh, seen extensively, what is the status of availability of antivenom in the rural areas? What is your presumption on that? Yeah, that's a really good question and a really good point because antivenom is made in sufficient quantities. Uh, one or two million vials of antivenom are made every year, so that could be called sufficient quantity. But the mm. distribution of the antivenom to the right places and at the right time the right time of year, of course, is just in the early and mid part of the monsoon in different parts of India. Mm. And the main place that it should be is at rural and district clinics and hospitals. Mm. And very often it is not found in these areas or there may not be a competent doctor on board to give the antivenom in a rural clinic. So these are some of the problems which government of India has to address. So the that is... Yeah, go ahead. No, that is the reason that I asked the question because, for example, I am from city Gohati in Assam and Gohati has a stockpile of antivenom where rarely there is snake bite case. But whereas if you go outskirt of Gohati and uh, maybe uh, in 200 kilometers from here where there are cases, unfortunately yeah. you don't get antivenom there. So there right. is a there is a some, uh, you know, I, the places where it needs antivenom, it's not there. So I think uh, uh, we need to uh, mobilize things at coming days because in coming time, I think the rate of snake bite will only increase. It's very true. And what's very interesting is that I did see a report from Odisha recently that hmm. uh, snake bite could, treatment could have an advantage in this whole COVID-19 experience because hmm. hospitals are gearing up in rural areas 
in order to try to deal with COVID-19. Now, this, mm. this spin-off could be incredible because respirators, for example, which are usually not in rural clinics, are now cool. being fitted in some Euro, rural clinics. And this cool. is very important for neurotoxic bites like cobra and crate bite. Cool. So it could mean that COVID-19 has a positive spin-off for snake very bite nice. treat, treatment in rural areas. Let's hope so. And I hope yeah. the government is listening very loud, loud and clear. <laughs> it's a great, great thing, uh, interpretation of a negative thing. This is really great that we never thought of in that way. So yeah, yeah that may help. <clears throat> Okay, yeah, I mean, I'm just threw in this picture of the book because it's a bit of self-advertisement. <laughs> no, but primarily to get people to understand that there are well, we have well over 300 different species of snakes in India, and yet there are only 15 species which have ever caused a human death, and only four species which are regularly responsible for the number of snake bite deaths that we have in the country. So the vast majority of snakes are harmless, which is a very positive point. And it's very, very important that people start to learn to identify them. Come on, we, we learn to, we know crows, we know pigeons, we know sparrows. <laughs> you know, <laughs> why shouldn't we know cobras, crates, Russell's vipers, and Saskia? True, 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 true. And the fact that they eat rodents is so important. Uh, without snakes, uh, we would probably have famine in India because so many rats would finish off so much of our grain stock in the country. True. All right, using a light at night, clearly demonstrated here. Uh, it's very easy to tell that to people, but we are learning slowly but surely that the best people for educating people are people who have had an experience with snake bite. So the person who was bitten by a snake without using a torch at night should be out there saying, look, I lost my leg or I almost lost my life because I stupidly didn't use a light. People go out in the back uh, to take a leak or they go out to uh, you know, start their water pump up and they've been doing it every night for the last 20 years. So why should they suddenly need a light? I'll tell you my personal experience though. One night the dog was barking at my house at the croc bank a long time ago. And I said, oh, bloody dog, I'll have to go out and shut it up. So I walked outside. I walk out of that house every night for the years that I was living there, nothing ever happened. The second step I took, I stepped on something a bit soft, but uh, a bit rough, and it hissed like a pressure cooker. It was a Russell's Viper. Now, I was hmm. in my sarong with bare feet, so he could have easily bitten me. Maybe he looked up and said, oh, it's Ram, it's okay, I won't bite you this time. <laughs> but here, this is a good lesson for you. <laughs> get back into the house and get a light, which I did. Hmm and went outside and it was a nice big Russell's wife, much scarier than I was, but I was just very <laughs> fortunate he didn't bite true, me. <laughs> true, true, so this true. is a really good lesson. Use a light at night. Okay, the second step is to improve the antivenom. And like you said, guarantee its availability. Uh, free antivenom is available at government hospitals, but do the government clinics out in the rural areas have it? Very often, no. And that's mm -hmm. really unfortunate. The antivenin producers have a particular uh, uh, requirement also, and that is to make antivenin stronger and more effective. There is a lot of geographic variation of venom, so venom should be collected from around the country in order mm. to make a better antivenin. So mm. there are some problems which have to be solved. True. Yep. Next. Yep. And uh, this is just reinforces the fact that antivenom is the only cure and people should understand this. The way we did it early on with the Urlas, I mean, they kept eating their medicines and said, look, our grandfathers taught us this. You're trying to tell me my grandfather's telling me lies that it's not good. And I was trying to be very patient with them. I said, look, the snake, when it bites, it's giving you an injection of venom, injection, just like a hypodermic needle, right? Yes, yes, with that we know. I mean, it gives an injection. Okay, so you need an injection to counteract the venom. Dong, to counteract the, light, the, the, light bulb goes, the light bulb goes on. People understand, <laughs> yes, you have to get an injection of antivenom in order to neutralize the venom which was injected. That's very easy for anybody to understand. It's a really True. good lesson. True. And that's the way we should also explain people. Absolutely. Absolutely. True. <laughs> yeah, and beware of bogus remedies. And this is something, Tiriaka and the snake stone. The snake okay. stone is very popular in the Northeast, actually, in many places. 
And unfortunately, it was spread through the Christian missions, actually, because it came from Europe. Uh, I think it came from Belgium originally, way back uh, in the 18, 1800s it came. And, and it continued. And, and this snake stone in this photograph, I, I got re not recently, but about 10 years ago from a, an, a mission in Kerala. And a, a guy called Father Antoninus, who is no longer with us, but he was producing these and selling them for 50 rupees each with this instructions of how you put it on the uh, wound and, and it'll suck all the venom out. And then to neutralize it, you put it in a cup of milk and all the venom will go out and you can reuse it. I mean, all this nonsense. And so, people believed it. Yeah. So I'll just uh, tell you one thing and uh, maybe of interest to you. I wanted to, I'll be, I just got an information that in Bihar, there is a hospital known as uh, Prata Tara. Uh, like that and they are using uh, this is primarily for I what information I gathered they are primarily snake bite related cases uh, they follow up and they uh, put this stone uh, in the uh, wherever that is bitten and the stone gets stuck to the place where the it is bitten and it stays stuck as long as they say that the venom is not drained out completely or absorbed by the stone and as soon as it happens the stone drops off well, if they have a case of death, they should be probably put up for murder because this huh. is really, this is really huh. absolutely nonsense. And yes. uh, I'd, I'd appreciate the contact if you. Let I, me I'll, 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 uh, yes, yes, because that is why I raised. Yeah, that is yeah. why I raised this, and I will also visit as soon as this restriction on COVID uh, goes down. Please. So, Please. and I'll try to, yeah. <clears throat> Good. Okay. My main project, as I said, is on snake bite, and we've been collecting. I, uh, together with uh, Jerry Martin, whom you know, have been collecting venom samples from throughout yeah. the country uh, with some of our other colleagues. And we are uh, sending it to the Indian Institute of Science lab. Dr. Karthik Sunagar mm. has a lab, uh, mm. Evolutionary Venomics mm. Laboratory, and he's mm. looking at the variation of venoms. Which, uh, is okay. extremely important and has come out with a couple of very interesting papers which now show and will tell the antivenom producers that they have to improve their antivenom by collecting venom from different parts of the country. This is all a very complicated issue because hmm. snakes are under the Wildlife Act. To collect snakes for venoms requires permissions from the various state governments and it is a very time consuming and laborious process. But hmm. Changes must happen, and true, maybe people true. are listening to us talk right now uh, who can help the process. True, true. Okay. Okay, step three in the whole snake bite prevention thing is to create rural medical support. And we've mentioned this already, antivenom and emergency ventilators should be in all ambulances and rural clinics, and training for rural medicos in the latest treatment protocol because they have been revised and people are using different treatment protocols in different parts of the country, which doesn't make sense. Well, it does make sense because different species of snakes are found in different parts of the country, but this all has to be regularized and done on a all India basis. True. Okay, this kind of epitomizes the fact that snakes are really frightened of us and they only want to be left alone. And uh, this is a very good case in point. This King Cobra is looking at me saying, what is this idiot doing sitting there? <laughs> All I want to do is get away. And he does. Yeah. In a few minutes, he's gone the other direction. <laughs> True. So that was the last slide. Yeah. So uh, we, we are done with the slides. So, uh, uh, so that was really a, a very important eye opener. And I, I saw that wherever you went, wherever you visited, uh, you created some station or some research station or something like that. So I feel it very unlucky that you should visit Northeast more often. And uh, so, so and no, start. I, love some... I, I really love so, it up there. Yeah. So please come here and make some station for us also, for <laughs> specifically for research on uh, uh, snakes and herpetofauna. So we are still lagging behind. Western Ghat has uh, jumped away and uh, yeah, is passing. A big, maybe maybe your presence has created a difference in Western Ghat. 
so you should uh, but so don't blame you me come on you guys let's get going i mean uh, you're, you're, so you're no, no, no. absolute paradise for reptiles especially snakes. so true true but uh, we may, we may need a um, station which may say that northeast um, uh, rainforest station or something like that good, good. so good. so in in coming time so what we'll do is we'll take some of the questions that uh, has uh, uh, been given here yeah. and uh, let's check out uh, what they say and uh, i'll just uh, uh, all of the highs and greetings are we from sir and me we say hi back and we'll just take the question so we are all big highs for you thank Absolutely. you for being thanks so uh, so we'll specific so we'll specifically go to uh, the question and uh, <clears throat> a huge question like a huge uh, 18 feet or 16 feet uh, python that you showed from everglade this is such a big question like that python and it is from uh, priyanka kadam she says hi rom great to see you online i have uh, two questions one is there a, any way we can seek permission from uh, State Forest Department to provide a two-day workshop, workshop on ethical snake rescue research. Who can benefit from knowledge, uh, no, knowing the right techniques of handling different species of snake? And number two, do share your experience about the visit to what? How do how do you pronounce that? Batis, Batis Shirla, Shirla in the uh, 1970s and the hundreds of reptiles we you saw being abused in the name of celebrating festival also you general op opinion on how to bridge the gap yeah well i mean several people have started uh, doing um, rescue workshops jerry martin soham uh, mukherjee mm -hmm. uh, uh, kedar uh, a lot of people around the country who are very uh, uh, you know competent and and very uh, knowledgeable snake people have started doing this. It has to be done on a much bigger level. We've got a, you know, a huge country <laughs> and mm -hmm. snake rescuers, uh, there are literally thousands of them out there. Some of them mm -hmm. pretty crazy dudes and some of them mm -hmm. not even alive anymore because of their stupidity. <laughs> so huh. yes, it's a great need. And uh, I, I, I don't have to give you the uh, instructions of how to do this. It's just a question of getting down while well, getting COVID-19 over, first of all. But uh, local forest departments are usually very helpful in, in wanting to organize things like this. And we've had very good experiences in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka and Muti over in, um, in uh, Andhra Pradesh. So yeah, it depends on the local state chief wildlife warden. Bend his ear, get over there to his office and tell him that, look, we've got to do this because snakes do need rescue, yes but they don't need stupid rescue. So mm -hmm. I think that's the answer to that question. About Batish Shirla, that was a very interesting experience to go over there during Nag Panchmi and I can't remember, it was 1970, 71 or something like that. And yes, we did see, I did see uh, several hundred cobras being brought in. They weren't necessarily, well, they were being abused in the sense that they were brought over, they were kept in mud pots for several days and then brought out and made to stand up and and uh, ladies would drop kumkum on them and pour a little bit of ghee on their heads, which I don't think was very helpful to them, and then said their prayers. Uh, it was a very interesting experience. I didn't see any snakes injured or killed or anything like that. Certainly not the way some of these rescuers grab cobras by the neck and do all sorts <laughs> of crazy stuff with them. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't agree with uh, catching snakes in large numbers and keeping them like that. But uh, I... I I was not particularly upset by what I saw. The, the people were reasonably respectful with the snakes and they weren't treating them in a, in a bad way. In fact, not even as bad as snake charmers used to. <laughs> when snake charmers usually took their snakes and ripped the fangs out or slit the venom glands and the snake would hardly live for a, a few weeks or a few months after that. Whereas the snakes uh, for Nag Panchmi and Batis Shirla were being released within a week after um, the, the after they were captured, probably back to similar areas in rice fields where they were caught. So I doubt that snake mortality was a problem. Yes, cruelness, cruelty to some degree, yes. But I doubt if many snakes actually died from the experience. 
So the next question is from Debayon. He says, sir, hello, sir. My question is, can you please elaborate more about the translocation tragedy that is happening quite a lot these days all over the country? Yeah, I, I mean, that little image of uh, showing you the uh, how the male King Cobra that we released, uh, we released him 40 kilometers away from where he was caught. And uh, I, I admit this was not a good thing to do, but it was to try to prove a point. And we did prove the point. He spent the next nine months trying to find his home range, and he traveled more than 100 kilometers. Luckily, he survived the whole time, the whole experience. He fed on the way. But when you remove and translocate any animal, whether it's a leopard or whether it's a snake or whether almost any animal, you are taking it away from its comfort zone, its home range. You're taking it from a place where he knows where to find food, where he knows how to find water, where he knows how to find a hiding place and putting him into a brand new circumstance. The study that uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Vidya Atreya did on leopards, which we uh, emphasized in the movie 21st Century Cats, showed very clearly that translocating the leopards in Maharashtra that the forest department was doing for years, translocating hundreds of leopards, was causing severe problems, not only killing a lot of leopards, but a lot of people were suffering and getting killed by these translocated leopards. So translocation is not a good answer for any animal. Yeah. So the next question is from uh, Krish, Krishnendu. Uh, sir, excuse me, excuse me. I, I have two small queries. How and why nesting behavior has evolved among king cobra? And are there any funny encounters with king cobra that you like to share? Well, um, yeah, it's actually a very good point to ask about the nesting behavior because well, we don't know other snakes who do this. There are a couple of snakes who actually gather sand together over the eggs which they have laid. There's a snake in the United States called the bull snake, which has been seen actually covering the eggs with sand after it buries them. So, but it doesn't stay with the, with the eggs and there's no nesting as such. So th this is a very important uh, question. And uh, I, I, uh, all I can say is I encourage someone to look into this, to try to figure this out how the king cobra has evolved this incredible, you know, when she makes this nest, it's a perfect incubation chamber, which keeps water out, but keeps high humidity inside. So there's no fungal growth of the eggs and on the eggs inside, and they're fully protected from the weather. Uh, interesting uh, experiences with king cobras. I'll tell you, I, every single time I experience, I meet a king cobra, it's an interesting experience. <laughs> Perhaps uh, the first one that I met was in Agumbe, uh, that picture you saw in 1971, a long time ago. And yes. uh, I thought, okay, it's interesting because I saw this black tail disappearing into the bushes. And there the rat snake, the ordinary rat snake is black. So I saw this mm. tail disappearing. I said, ah, rat snake, wow. And being the typical youthful snake hunter that I was, <laughs> uh, I did a football dive on him, sort of, you know, American football style, grabbed, all <laughs> him, grabbed his tail, and suddenly this hood appears above me and looking down at me. And I said, uh oh, it's not a rat snake. And I'm not sure what I thought at that moment, but I did, I probably, my heart stopped for a few seconds saying, uh oh, I'm in a bad, bad situation right now. So immediately I let go of the tail. But uh, <laughs> luckily the snake then of course, didn't really want to do anything to me. It just wanted to show me who it was. It was a king cobra and started crawling away. Well, I got my wits about me. I jumped up and grabbed a stick this time and uh, grabbed it again by the tail. And the rest of it, of course, I had to go through the whole motion of catching it. But that first instant when my heart stopped beating with the king cobra looking over my head was probably the most dramatic experience I ever had in my life with any animal. So, so sir, I have a question. Like you just, uh, you, you just uh, uh, gave an example of an incident of 1971 when you were a young young man. So now as you look back, now uh, after so much of experience in the field and so much of awareness and knowledge, and so what message will you give to young Romula Sweetaker at this point of age, if you, if you, are, if you ever met that uh, chap who was like very novice at one point or very over enthusiastic, or handling a snake, maybe with not as much caution as it is required. So wh what would you tell him? Well, precisely that. Use a lot of caution. 
No, I, I think people are, uh, the, the ones that I'm seeing uh, online that when I have the bad luck for someone to show me some <laughs> idiot uh -huh. catching a snake uh -huh. or handling it in a stupid uh -huh. way, is mm. all I could say is uh, be respectful to the snake. Uh, mm -hmm. Whenever mm -hmm. I talk to these snake rescuers who are doing stupid things, we had mm -hmm. an experience in Maharashtra not too, just last mm -hmm. year or year before last, where one mm -hmm. guy, I'm not going to mention names, but there are pictures mm -hmm. of him True. holding Russell's vipers in a crazy way. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, so I started out by saying, you like snakes? And mm -hmm. the guy said, oh, I, I love snakes. Mm -hmm. I said, why are you so disrespectful to them? Mm -hmm. Why do you play with them as though that you don't have any respect for these wonderful animals? And mm -hmm. he was a, t a bit taken aback. He expected me to start cursing him or something like that. I was, no, I was very calm and trying to tell him, look, since you respect snakes, treat them gently, treat them carefully, and above mm -hmm. all, be careful yourself. If you get mm -hmm. bitten by a snake, your parents, your loved ones, what are they going to feel? They're not going to say this stupid idiot because it's my son or it's my friend. They're going to say that awful snake bit him. That mm. awful snake killed him. And mm. then snakes continue to have this horrible reputation. So that's True. my main lesson. My main plea to all these crazy mm. dudes out there who are messing around with snakes in a stupid way. Be mm. respectful. Be careful for the mm. snake and for yourself. It'll mean a lot, both for the snakes and for the people who like snakes. So so I also take the opportunity to tell, because you are not on Facebook, but uh, I am on Facebook and I see lots of images of people handling snakes uh, and posting. So there is a very nice way to counteract without abusing that fellow or saying anything. You can just report the photograph to Facebook telling the reason that you are. Uh, and if that photograph get too many number of objections, the photograph will be taken care of by the Facebook itself. So you can just report you can just report the photograph and ask your friends who are in the network to report it as well. And as a result, most of the thing happens because somebody posts a photograph, somebody who you idealize as post a photograph of uh, holding a snake. He or she may have the expertise of holding the snake and posting, but you may not have. And you then uh, just have to follow and you follow that and some mishap happens. So better. If we can uh, report those photographs, I think it would have a better result rather than confronting or uh, quarreling over uh, internet or something like that. So uh, moving on, sir, uh, this is uh, this is a uh, not a question, but I wanted to take it. Shomorjit Oja from uh, Bura Chapuri Wildlife Sanctuary in Assam. Uh, he says that straight from Bura Chapuri, streaming your session to benefit frontline staff. So this session has been uh, for forest department staff. They are streaming it. Thank you, Shamarjit, so much. That is highly appreciated. Uh, then we move on to Abhishek. And Abhishek says, in Northeast India, most of the bite cases are non-venomous. As a result, quirk and traditional healers are successful in treating of these cases. In such cases, how do we educate the people in such situation? Well, the majority of snakes are harmless, number one, like you just pointed hmm. out. The majority mm. of snake bites are not fatal. Even venomous mm. snake bites are not fatal. Mm. So you can give Coca-Cola or Campa Cola mm. or whatever, mm. and you'll probably mm. cure the guy. Mm. The, the point is, a snake bite could be fatal, and you don't mm. have time to mess around and wait for it. The idea, mm. this is why our, the, the basic message is, if someone's bitten by a snake and it's not easily identifiable, get straight mm. to hospital for observation number one, and number two, mm. for antivenom, if necessary. The doctor mm. is going to know what to do. Have faith in the doctor. Now, mm. the other problem that we have to solve, obviously, is what you said earlier, making sure that all the rural clinics have antivenom. This is mm. a really important part of it. This is not something you and I can do. This is something that the government, the state and central government have to do. So this mm. is our message to them. But to the mm. local people, if someone is bitten, get to the hospital. Do not waste time. OK. So uh, sir, thank you so much. Uh, we have like we have taken uh, because we are already lagging behind time. And we had like one and a half hour session, so more yeah. than what we expected from you. And thank right. you so much. Thank you so much for your time, sir. I, I hope that uh, in near future, in coming time, if we can have uh, uh, some more session with some more expert 
and you may help us and you may bless us in this effort and we wish to continue in this effort of uh, uh, spreading awareness in a different medium where uh, uh, we cannot um, meet person face to face but we have such a brilliant medium through, through which we can reach uh, lots and lots of people and one uh, one message from you can change life of many people who can even who, uh, one life save is more than enough as i think so here uh, we are we can change here the internet medium has a potential to save and uh, uh, present knowledge to many people so i again congratulate uh, uh, myself for having you here and thank you so much for being here sir and Thanks, sir you st you stay back sir i'll just end the live broadcast and come back to you sir okay thanks very much everybody wonderful thank you thank you so much all of you for listening to us thanks again